So, uh, yeah, sorry uh, that I have to leave a bit earlier, but uh, Giacomo will stay afterwards for some questions. Um, we are talking uh, today about uh, the question whether the research is happening in the text fields in regards to art history research as an example. Um, first of all, uh, we have uh, four authors, which are uh, also the um, Restaging Fashion Project, and um, we are of uh, from the University of Applied Science, I have been, uh, and uh, it's a research group on information visualization, and uh, they are conducting like uh, several projects, and yeah, we are on the slides, and the whole uh, restaging fashion team, and our head of the team, uh, Marianne Dirk, on the right, the third person, maybe you know of them. As I mentioned, um, the Restaging Fashion Project is a digitalization and um, visualization project. And uh, here we have a visualization of some of the topics, the research topics uh, the UC lab at the University of Applied Science in Potsdam is working on. And uh, the highlighted uh, sections are the topics of the Restaging Fashion Project. It's, it's an interdisciplinary project um, which is also reflected in the persons who uh, work at the project. We have an art historian, an information visualization scientist, and uh, one person from the information science. The main part, or the first part of the project, has been uh, the digitization of multimodal um, media and sources. We digitized over 600 paintings from the State uh, Museum in Berlin and uh, prints and drawings, uh, I think over 500 now maybe. Our aim was 1,000, but I don't think we are getting there. Um, and um, exemplary uh, 15 historical dresses. So we 3D scanned uh, these dresses from uh, the um, Germ Germanische Nationalmuseum in Nuremberg, actually. So that was the digitization uh, part. And uh, now the visualization part, we build a um, semantically modeled database, uh, mainly using using CRM, but also uh, scores and DC. And um, why did we do that? We um, were thinking that multimodal data requires the specification of relations, and that's a very crucial thing to make that visible uh, on a metadata level, but also as a foundation for the visualization. So. That's why we choose to build a semantically modeled database um, as a foundation for the visualizations or the visual interfaces, which are the results or will be the results of the project. Okay, thank you. Um, so at the very kind of early stage of our research process, we started kind of asking ourselves what should be modeled then as linked open data and what should be entered as a freeform text, uh, basically what should be visible and um, what will be presentable in our database and what should be hidden. As the raw data that we started with contain quite detailed uh, yet unstructured information, we had uh, data on the inscription, the artworks and their position, uh, detailed information regarding the history of the object and on provenance history, or um, different description, for example, according to uh, Panofsky's uh, levels of interpretation. And uh, we could answer that question by saying that from a technical point of view, from an infrastructural perspective, basically everything could be transposed to uh, semantic structures, to semantic databases. And for example, as Linda already mentioned, references models such as CDOC CRM encourage the detailed description of an object through an event-driven structure. And as you can see from the, from the slide, this image shows kind of the classes hierarchy of such ontology. However, as we can see from the previous slide, and uh, this one which shows the data modeling of just two entities in our database, um, those are graphical representation that we, had, that we have created to uh, understand, check, and navigate ontologies and our kind of uh, database itself. And uh, in a way we could say that event-centric data modeling is generally not easily accessible, visible, or transparent. And uh, we can also see uh, this kind of statement from the point of view of uh, 
different museums, we have even big institutions that are uh, promoting linked open data, um, struggle in this. And for example, in this slide, you can see a um, peer-reviewed uh, lesson by the programming historian, which explains how to make Sparkle queries of the British Museum data. But the lesson was uh, later retired since the British Museum, as they state, uh, failed to report uh, um, and failed to maintain their collection database in a consistent and reliably accessible manner. So although their SparkQL syntax uh, and, uh, and query remains correct, uh, the uh, URLs uh, um, they tried to connect uh, became too unreliable to be used in uh, such working session. On the other hand, uh, the Reich Museum in, in Amsterdam, for example, shares all of its object metadata at a, at a basic level online in different format and uh, through an API as linked open data. But the only examples they share using the linked art model, as you can see in the top right part, uh, which is a more descriptive framework, uh, um, is reported, as they state, to be experimental and both the implementation of it and their use of identifiers will change. So we could say that sharing and maintaining a deeply model, deeply semantically uh, linked open data is somehow excessive, both from a technological perspective and regarding to the cataloging of the information. Um, manual tagging can be performed by domain experts, um, but it cannot easily be applied to uh, large volumes of uh, data or content that uh, it, uh, already exists. And this leads museums to share only a subset of their data, just uh, partial information as LOD, and making it very intricate to research more elaborated and reflexive information. So uh, how could you bring that together uh, with an art historian perspective and the, uh, the typical art historian way of working, the workflow and research? Um, I uh, identified three objects which might be also exemplary for other historical scientists. Um, at first, uh, art historians uh, work with original objects. They are creating information. That would be the first step. Um, by creating information, I mean describing uh, the uh, objects formally and semantically. Um, regarding basic information like the date, the artist, the location, and so forth, uh, but, all, but also including the discourse on the objects, like the history of the object. Um, what's the provenance? Uh, has there been some restoration events, maybe? Uh, change of ownership is also very crucial for art historian research. And I think uh, some of that information can be very well modeled in, uh, for instance, uh, CDOC CRM, which is event-based. So you can create an event uh, of restoration and what exactly changed uh, um, with the object. But it requires really a lot of uh, resources and uh, hours to create that. And uh, yeah, you can maybe ask yourself, does it uh, worth it? Uh, will, uh, how many people will um, ask those questions on this very specific questions on the object? Uh, secondly, uh, art historian research, if uh, the objects are already existing in a digital environment, um, then there would be the part of accessing the data and retrieving information from already existing uh, systems who someone else described formally and semantically. And uh, yeah, art historian would do that basically in platforms and museum catalogs, but also in, uh, on the web and in library catalogs. So I think uh, this concept is quite familiar to all of you. And uh, certainly um, in the end of the research, uh, there is, um, yeah, fortunately a publication. And I think art history is um, still a bit traditional and conventional and most of the publications are books or papers in a printed form and they are illustrated a lot by images, but there's uh, not um, a culture yet of uh, publishing uh, data papers or even data on GitHub or on other platforms. So that's a brief description of the workflow in art historian research. And uh, now we come to maybe the main question um, based on the description of the art historian um, workflow. So basic information on the cultural heritage objects uh, and the discourse can formally be described on a data level, 
but uh, observations which are leading to publication in a written form need space and context and they also need uh, space within the database. So uh, is the real research maybe, maybe happening then in the text fields, in the free text fields, which are not formally described very uh, detailed? So um, after this kind of brief of, uh, um, overview of, let's say, the data infrastructure, the museum, and the art historical methodology, um, we started to wonder whether from a data visualization and uh, interface design point of view, we could find a middle ground where uh, a, an editor could write a more reflexive text, uh, make tentative observation, and just oppose a specific part of this uh, text or essay with uh, linked open data. Um, we were visually inspired by the um, ideas of Project Xanadu from Ted Nelson in the 60s, and although this was a total fail, it was a technical and successful project, uh, it had an um, interesting visual structure of the information where lines uh, um, connected different documents uh, and allowed to navigate and compare multiple sources uh, at the same time. So with that as a references, we started to develop a framework where the art historian in our team, uh, Sabine de Gunter, um, could write uh, different essays, and in this case is the example of the allegory of the five senses in, uh, in our collection, and a link um, a specific part of the text with uh, entries in our uh, semantic database. Where, for example, um, a term such as mirror in the text could be linked to the related vocabulary entry that we use. Uh, in this case, we can see Spiegel, the icon class uh, uh, notation systems, and therefore uh, uh, all the um, items in the collection that are connected with such uh, um, vocabulary entry. The paintings mentioned in the, in the text uh, could, of course, be linked to the objects in the collection. In this case, uh, we have the, the taste that links to the allegory of the taste, uh, as well as uh, people, places, uh, and, uh, and much more. And all of these in order to support the art historical discourse, as um, Linda already mentioned, to give a possibility to write more uh, reflexive text uh, and uh, have uh, guided entry points to, to browse our uh, collection. So, okay, the GIF is a bit lagging, but working. Um, uh, with that, we arrive kind of at the um, current version of our interface. Uh, uh, as you can see, um, where the written text uh, is the same text, the allegory of the five senses in that case, uh, are framed by the main image of a selected um, entity on the left and um, with a graph representation on the right. The, the GIF is not following what I'm saying, so bear with me. And uh, a reader can just scroll or click on specific uh, relations in the text uh, and um, see specific metadata about one object and uh, um, see the relations that are displayed in that. Uh, or can, uh, as you can see in this case, uh, freely move away from the essay, browsing the data and exploring the, the collection with a user-determined uh, level of granularity. And in this case, the columns uh, are, um, show the relationship, uh, of course, from the, from the previous node, and we uh, structured in customizable categories, and in the, the case of uh, this essay, the first thing that we see are the related artworks, uh, mainly painting in this case, uh, uh, documentation of uh, one object, and uh, uh, classification systems. So to come to, co to our conclusions, um, we have taken into account different perspectives, um, first of all, the uh, infrastructure, more technical view. In this view, um, yeah, potentially everything can be expressed by a semantic web structures with powerful tools like CDOC CRM and languages. So yeah, it's possible, let's say, let's put it like this. Um, and in the, in the museum perspective, basic information, descriptions on the objects are required for the uh, visitors of a museum. It's a very crucial information to have that, but if it goes further than that, then it's a trade-off between standardization and accuracy, in particular taking also the resources to create and maintain also uh, these data structures into account. 
You can see that in our examples that there is actually a not a museum as far as we know that really shares all of the uh, model data and goes beyond uh, the like basic modeling in terms of description of the museum object. Um, the art historian perspective or in general the research perspective would be that in general it's um, yeah, to express research observations and results, there's a need, a need for an open space somewhere in the data. And also in this perspective, um, quantitative information, for instance, on objects and their relation, which can be uh, queried and expressed uh, statistically, are worth to be modeled in triple structures. So if you use a quantitative approach, it's a very um, good thing to do to um, formally describe data in that manner. But if you are um, following more uh, reflexive or uh, elaborated or contextualized information, um, it's our solution to present a visual interface for that where you can combine those approaches. And uh, we would like to end with that uh, hypothesis of Galloway uh, to trigger the discu uh, discussion maybe a bit. Um, yeah on the question if maybe some things are simply not representable and if really the computer is our indicator for that. Or to formulate it a bit different, is humanistic research a translatable and machine readable format? And does it worth it or does it have to maybe? So thank you very much. <laughs>